Hello, lovely Water Trio listeners, and welcome back. I'm here with Kelly and Cassandra, and we're all ready for the astrology for that week, straddling the end of April, so the 27th of April through till the Sunday, the 10th of May. So, gals, who's kicking off in the Astro Stakes? Oh la la, we need to have a little looky-loo. It could be me. I think it's you actually, Kel. Yeah, yeah. On, the, on, on Monday the 4th. So the aspect that I wanted to highlight in this time frame is Venus square Neptune. And I have a few reasons for doing that. First of all, Venus will square Neptune from 20 Gemini to 20 Pisces on May the 3rd, which I think is actually going to be May the 4th in Australia, May the 3rd in Mm -hmm. um, Canada and the States. It'll probably be May the 4th in Europe and in Australia. So Venus square Neptune... Before I dive into what this means, I want to say that this is the first in a series of Venus square Neptune aspects that we will have Mm. over the next few months uh, because Venus is going to have a retrograde this month. Uh, We're going to talk more about Venus retrograde, I think, in our next episode because that's when the Venus retrograde will happen. Um, But just so you know, she is going retrograde, which means she's going to make this interaction with Neptune three times. So we get one at the start of May. We'll have another one later in May. And then I think we have another one in um, July. Uh, but don't quote me on the July one because I am I could be having a Neptune foggy moment. So Venus square Neptune does, it's one of the signature aspects that's going to infuse the month of May. And this is the classically the rose-coloured glasses aspect where one is idealistic or overly hopeful or seeing only the good things or only the positive potential in a situation. Normally with Venus square Neptune, I'm talking about it in the context of romantic relationships and there's often a little bit of a caution of like if something or someone seems too good to be true, they probably are. It's sort of take those perfect seeming promises or situations with a bit of a grain of salt. So this aspect does come with a little bit of caution where we can get swept up in something that in time might not meet our expectations or our initial hopes I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer with this, but just to more be realistic that it's easy to overlook something substantial or something practical or something realistic with this Venus square Neptune because there is this sort of, um, I just want it to work out and I think if I care enough or if I love enough or if I go that extra mile, I will be able to make up for the shortcomings in this situation or with this particular person. The other side of Venus square Neptune is that it does have a very strong creative and artistic streak. So I think one of the things you could do with this aspect is you might uh, kind of lose some of your inhibitions and sink into an artistic experience like listening to music. Um, I'm not musical. So when I think artistic and creativity, I, I might be writing or reading poetry or even just listening to music. You might just be dancing it out. You might have a few drinks and have a dance party in your living room kind of thing. Uh, So there is the possibility to do some creative. uh, It's not about quality of the creativity. It's about the experience of being kind of disconnected from time and just being in the flow, having the muses or the inspiration come through you. So needless to say, Venus square Neptune is not practical and it might not be timely. So you might forget something, you might overlook something, you might miss something. Uh, Neptune does have a spiritual quality and it might bring an invitation to reconnect with a breathwork practice or a meditation practice. So there are some things you can use that energy for, but you probably can't use it for maintaining a strict routine or being really responsible or showing up somewhere on time, if that makes sense. So it's a, it's a juicy type of aspect. How do you gals see this aspect? What are your thoughts about Venus square Neptune? Yeah, I agree with all of the things you mentioned, Kel. And I think too, like one one key word I think of, particularly with the square where there's a little bit of tension or things not feeling quite as they should, is that sort of disillusionment. And so mm. as Venus is really slowing down in preparation for the retrograde, you know, it, it you might be sort of thinking, oh, is this all it is? You know, in terms mm. of perhaps... Um, a, a relationship situation, you know, those kind of inner rumblings might be starting to happen already. That connection to Neptune is like, oh, like 
what did I see in this situation? You know, if it's a more of an exist long term um, uh, situation, I don't know if really many people are meeting people right now, but maybe online is a possibility. Um, so yeah, there's that sense of like the square sort of denotes a little bit of caution. Um, mm. Or just perhaps take those cues from Venus. She's not moving fast now, so neither should you. Um, but again, I also do love the idea of, you know, maybe some healthy escapism can also perhaps um, reduce any mental anxiety or stress or what have you. So, you know, if it's that, you know, glass of wine and a Netflix night or, you know, online dance parties or whatever it's that sort of just like let's get out of reality for a little bit and do some things that we really enjoy that we can kind of just you know um oh, I've got this song in my head some old-fashioned song I can't remember what it is and I'm not gonna see <laughs> but it's like that sense of just like to drift away you know and just kind of like um just just you know sail away enjoy it Stay um, away by Enya. Oh, no, no. Not, en- not Enya, no, but it's like, <laughs> um, give me the beach boys and free my soul. Oh, that one, okay? Oh, I love that but song. The, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I want so to get lost in your rock and roll like, or something. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not a very rock and roll sound song. But that being said, it's kind of like, the you know, let – you know, we're all stuck, you know, and it's like, let's just imagine being in the places we want to be or the places we could be. And so, you know, that can kind of get those, you know, the tension will kind of be the, what generates that creativity or generates that, what are we going to do together when things are better than now, potentially. So your thoughts, Lishi? I just, I love what you both said and I agree with it all. And, uh, you know, while you were talking, Cass, I kept thinking about that film Life is Beautiful where oh, yeah. Um, yeah. it's set in the concentration camps during World War II and the father was trying to allow the boy to get into a, well, he created a fantasy situation so the boy didn't get the reality of where they really were. And he was playing all these games and doing all these things so that the that the boy was like, swept up in the fantasy of things and because reality was so hard and he didn't want him to be scarred by it. And this can be, I feel like, you know, there's not much else I can say. You've both filled it out so beautifully, but just to add that thing and of like the playfulness of Venus in Gemini and what she can offer with that square to the fantasy land of Neptune in Pisces. It's like, okay, have some fun, play around, see what you can do with this and, you know, feel free to kind of dip out of reality for a while. Um, I think the creative component of this is really beautiful and is really possible. And, um, yeah, what you were saying, Kel, about spiritual practices, um, because this is the retrograde and this is this will be hit third time, it's almost a chance to look at this as a way to revisit whatever you're doing in this part of your chart with along with, around any kind of practices, any kind of rituals, any kind of sense of, right, yeah, how can I bring some extra oomph or extra power to my spiritual practices. So, yeah. Love it. Yeah, I just realised this is happening on a Sunday, I think, uh, or the 3rd of May is a Sunday, so it could be a Monday depending on where you are. Which And I always think Neptune aspects are great on the weekend because they're perfect for just doing nothing, not being productive, not doing the housework, not tidying up, just that flake kind of vibe. Um, but Cass, when you mentioned the word disillusionment, it reminded me that one of the words I often see with this aspect is disappointment, like that feeling of something mm. not coming together, maybe being let down. It may or may not be in an earth shattering way that has consequences. Like sometimes it has and sometimes it doesn't, but it is that sense of like, oh, I'm disappointed that didn't happen. Um, so yeah, maybe exactly. just processing that emotion a little bit. Um, mm. Yeah. So a little bit of a uh, kind of fuzzy vibe to start this period, I guess. Yeah. Potentially a hangover <laughs> of some type. I mean, I, 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 I don't think it's... A Netflix hangover. Yeah, or even like a, if, if you are someone who drinks or maybe you have other substances, but, I mean, it it seems like a um, G&T or a vodka soda type weekend. <laughs> well, I've seen a lot going on this week of... Um, Oh, what is it? The Contessa, the Italian Contessa. Oh, yes, the, she's doing this the, like, picture of Cosmos. 
I know, yeah. I know. And I think it's like 9.20 in the morning and everyone's like, yeah, yeah, let's get on to that. It's like time is flexible and it's like, you know, it must be midday somewhere in the world. So Always yeah, five o'clock doesn't... somewhere. Exactly, exactly. I also love that so... we were, um, there was singing in the Venus Neptune because I do think that's a very musical aspect and Cass, you, there was like yeah. actually sang for us, which is beautiful. And of all of the songs I could serenade you with, I really let the team down. Oh, no, we loved it. It was just so out of character for you. <laughs> exactly. Oh, you know, you might be. people might be a bit surprised, you know. I, I like to, you know, experiment. Love it. All righty, I think it, we might be talking a little bit about the node now. Okay, is that our next yes. aspect, Kel? Yes, that's you, okay. Cass. Yeah. Um, I won't be singing in this segment, just so you know, but um, <laughs> the node. We... <laughs> so basically what, what's happening this week too is a real uh, shift for mutables. So we're going to be having the north node move into Gemini, therefore the south node moving into Cancer. So we're starting to, you know, have some shifts and changes around the eclipse energy. Mm. So for the next 18 months, if you've got a mutable chart, so let's say Gemini, uh, Virgo, Sag or Pisces, you know, rising and putting your angles as a mutable chart, um, there's going to be a lot more perhaps forward action, some more dramatic events or th- those kind of shifts and changes that happen around um, when, when act- uh, eclipses activate the angles. It can really bring... You fast forward events, you know, and I think when we talk about the angles, it's like the four pillars that kind of create our life. So this is going to really um, shift and change things in potentially exciting and different ways. And so we were just sort of pre-chatting before we got um, recording the episode and, um, you know, what we just sort of expect out of this uh, event. And it sort of reminded me of, you know, the last time Gemini, uh, the node sort of shift from Cancer to Gemini. And so many of you may realise that the last time the node was in Cancer was when September 11 happened. So quite a dramatic life sh- life shifting event for many people and just sort of like, you know, the global stage uh, for, you know, a certain extent. And then the node moved into Gemini and we were just sort of talking about, you know, life and business and all the things. And back then I was much younger and I was working as uh, for Christian Dior, like the cosmetics company. And I remember at the time that lipstick sales like went through the roof because everybody needed that feel good factor, spend a little bit of money um, that doesn't you know break the bank, but really makes you feel great. And I was like, OK, well, you know, this could potentially happen again to some extent, but what will people be buying? And I think we're in a very different place and time. You know, we were just fresh out of that Jupiter-Saturn conjunction in Taurus. So it was, yes, let's buy the lipstick or buy the thing that makes us feel good. And now we're kind of on the verge of the Jupiter-Saturn conjunction in Aquarius. And so the node moving into Gemini and air sign, just putting more emphasis on that element of air. So I think uh, collectively we might see a lot more um, wanting fresh or new information or perhaps the um, industry of self-education will get, you know, quite big. And of course, the converse of that is perhaps, you know, shifting paradigms around old beliefs or, um, you know, old philosophies as we start to move into, um, you know, fresh ideas or more, um, you know, I guess we can see it sort of already happening already now, how we're shifting to such a more uh, online space um, compared to perhaps like a, a bricks and mortar type of style of business. So I think the uh, the shift of the node into Gemini is just really going to catapult us collectively into this very air element and the way that we share information with each other and, and disseminate it is just going to be such a, uh, a massive shift and I think once that node moves in there then we just have you know just another thing in air now to really kind of emphasize that so what do you girls think about the node moving into Gemini Leash. um 
I look, I'm just happy to have them away from the cardinal, <laughs> being a cardinal, <laughs> you know, having cardinal <laughs> angles. I'm just happy to have them out of those major aspects and away from Pluto. It's like, it's, I don't know, it's it's that extra bit of astrology now that Saturn's in Aquarius that I was looking forward to this year. So I think, you know, the whole thing, it feels like we're moving away from one truth, the single truth that Sagittarius mm. is often put at, and the multiple truths. We were talking in the pre-show chat as well about, you know, how right now there are people trying to say that they have the truth and they're trying to sell their truth. Mm. And mm -hmm. I don't think that's going to fly for much longer. I think people are getting very, will be more discerning and trying to work out what's real for them and what's a, what's a many truths and the many different opportunities that are around for them rather than having to listen to one specific mentor or one specific, you know, guru mm. or, or one specific, you know, pope or, or whatever. Um, so it's making the decisions for themselves and I think, we do live in an information age in so many ways. And I loved all the points you were talking about with air casts. And I think this is really, especially with the Jupiter Saturn conjunction in an air sign at the end of the year, kicking off this next 200 year cycle. I feel like there's a, I don't know, there's divine timing in this. And there's a reason that the North Node is also in an air sign while all of this is going on. And it's moving us into a totally new information age. I know that the internet created something, but I feel like they'll, during this 18 month period, we're going to see a real ramp up in technology or the way that we share and collaborate and communicate together with each other. So it'll almost be like that difference between fax machines and emails. You know, it's like, what will be the next raise up of that? Mm. So that's the call I'm making about it. But yeah, for those with mutable charts, um, you know, it's your, it's your turn to kind of look at, at it, like look at where you really are hungry and where you really want to draw towards and do that North Node stuff and perhaps use that South Node as a bit of a vacuum cleaner in other areas of your chart to, to, to clear things up, get simple, get focused. Um, yeah, that's from me. What about you, Kel? Oh, such great points, both of you. Uh, I guess what I would add is that the Cancer Capricorn parts of our charts have an opportunity to kind of stabilize. Um, they can find a new yes. sort of like structure. You know, Cancer Capricorn are two signs that do like to keep things kind of safe and protected and they've been really unsettled. They've been poked and prodded in this last 18 months. I think since November of 2018, that's when the nodes went into 18, yeah. Yeah, Cancer Capricorn. So if... The nodes leaving Cancer Capricorn suggests stability for them. The nodes coming into Gemini and Sag is then going to indicate a period of instability where things are more in flux and there's a lot more change and transition. I love the vacuum cleaner sort of idea leash because the south node going into Sag is definitely looking to kind of churn through and uh, release and let go of. Uh, I was thinking about... Uh, what was this like for me? You know, the the last time the South Node was in Sag and the North Node node was Gemini was about mid October two thousand one to early April two thousand three, like just after September eleven, as you were saying, Cass. And that for me was I was I started that period kind of like what am I doing with my life and my career and where am I going? And there was quite a lot of should I do this? Should I do that? And then by the end of it, I had established my astrology practice. So there was a real sense of like almost churning through options and getting to the place that was going to be a good fit for me. The other thing that I think about with the Sag Gemini polarity is the idea of facts versus faith. So with the North Node in Gemini, it's like, what's the data say? What's the information say? What is the, you know, what is the technical, um, you know, what is the statistical research? And it's like very information hungry, whereas the South Node in Sag is a little bit more about what's the big picture? What's the context for this? And are we connecting into the things that we believe? Our philosophy is our inspiration. So it's sort of balancing, like, are you a person who needs information before you do stuff? Or are you someone who can take things on faith? And I think it's going to raise questions about that uh, personally, uh, particularly around the Gemini Sag parts of our chart. Mm -hmm. But as, as you mentioned, Cass, it is going to bring in the eclipses kind of slowly transitioning into the Gemini Sagittarius uh, pairing. So 
going forward from mid-year, we will start to see, you know, uh, full moon or uh, new moon eclipses in Gemini and Sag. And that will, they will be like punctuation points with this, with this cycle. So it is, it's quite a big shift. Very. Yeah. I was thinking back to that time, actually, that was when I ended, like I'd been living overseas for three years and I remember oh, wow. September 11 happening and I, I moved back home and I started studying. And, you know, for me, it's third house, ninth house. So it was a really <gasps> textbook yeah. astrology wow. yeah. of, of yeah. what was going totally. on. Totally. You know? mm. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. I, the other thing I guess so. too is um, just on the notes briefly, the nodes kind of unsettle things. And I just think generally that because we have the nodes changing signs in this two week period, there's just a feeling of like, oh, that thing that was quite rocky is now stable. And this other part that was sort of consistent doesn't seem to be. Yeah. So it's like just having to our psyches and our, our internal space, having to adjust to things being a little different. And I think from mm. a like day to day, this fortnight, this two week period, it's just like, oh, that's that's going to be different now. Um, and you might like it or you might not, but it's just adjusting to those transitions. Yeah, yeah I really feel like, well, sorry, Leishy, go. No, that's okay. No, I was just thinking, because that's the area that Jupiter's just spent 12 months in too, in Sagittarius. It's almost like all these things that we've built up and we've had opportunities and excitement within, suddenly the South Node's going to be coming in and dismantling some of that and almost like taking away I don't know, bringing us back to what will really stand the test of time um, mm. and what was kind of frippery. What were you going to say, Cass? Yeah, I find like when the nodes change signs, um, what, what can happen with people is that, you know, when you daydream, you're just mm -hmm. doing your thing and you're thinking about things or going for your walks and um, to get out of the house and you're thinking about things and it's almost like this you know, you'll, you'll notice that your thoughts will start changing and maybe it's those house topics that are starting to, to shift. You know, you might see um, that you're like, oh, I wouldn't mind kind of growing or developing in this particular area or I'm thinking maybe I need to make some changes or progress in this part of my life or do I need to address some things here? So I think like that's a way that you can see how, you know, you're almost like uh, subconsciously starting to bring in this energy. And I think the nodes can really do that. And I don't know whether it's because they're technically in, you know, we can't see them in the sky, they're calculated points. And so they're almost like this kind of like reflective duality of where you sort of want to put a little bit more effort or where you want to put a little bit more of your um, inspiration or, or where you feel like that internal compass might be shifting just a little bit. Yeah, yeah, totally. And the other piece around the South Node is, I think, that idea of dispersing. You know, the South Node wants to put mm. out type of thing. And sometimes that can drain us or deplete us, but sometimes that activates the sharing. You know, it allows us to yeah. find opportunities to share your ideas, whether it's through teaching or publishing. I think the caution with the South Node in Sag is like dogma or you know, mm -hmm. what are people mm. doing in the name like of their faith, the fundamentalism? Mm. Um, that's probably a little mm. bit of a caution. Um, and unfortunately we did see a lot of that last time the South Node was in Sag. Yeah, yeah. sure. It always reminds me of Speaker's Corner in London where there's these guys that literally get up on a soapbox and they just pound the crowd with their beliefs. And it's it's kind of entertainment because, you know, they may not believe in it. There's often hecklers there, but these people are so believing in their faith that they feel like they really have to, like, tell the world about it. So hopefully that kind of stuff will be leaving and going and um, or if it is existing that it will get heckled. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a big adjustment, big adjustment. Yeah. 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 I guess. Yeah. If you can remember your 2001 story, then that might give you a little bit of insight or guidance as to how things sort of might be a little bit similar moving forward. Similar yeah. house topic themes at the minimum. Yeah. I think that was mid October, wasn't it? 2001. Yeah, all, all the way through, through to about two, April, I think. Of 2003, mm -hmm. yeah. It's about 18 mm -hmm. months, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Where were you in 2002? Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, let me think. I had the south node going through my seventh and I got divorced. 
<laughs> they would go and send it publicly. <laughs> but that's what happens. So it's a pretty uh, textbook uh, situation. That's like, that sounds thing. pretty there textbook, doesn't it? Not that everybody who has the yeah. South Node going through their seventh will have a divorce, but that's certainly one of the manifestations. Yeah. Yeah. But did Cass, that Ooh. means the North Node was in oh. your first. Does that also mean that you felt like you came into your own in some some way? Like you discovered, yeah, maybe it was, ha- it was yeah. basic. Yeah, yeah, totally. It wasn't like anything happened or you know one defining event. Um, it was I, I just knew I was going in a direction that was at odds with you know where the relationship was going. So. Um, and the Saturn Pluto opposition pretty much happened across my ascendant descendant. And so it's like, when we talk about the twin towers falling, I felt like I had towers falling in my own life. And so he had to go overseas because he was in the military. And so, um, he, he did his time over there and came back and I just knew like, it's just, it's not gonna be an ongoing thing. And cause I just knew there was things I wanted to do with my life. He just wasn't really on board with that. And so it was just like, I love you, but I love me more. <laughs> and yeah. then I just was like, yeah. you know, and that was that, you know, the node in the first, you know, that that push, that desire to self-actualize. I mean, I was only young then. I was like 24 or something. So, uh, you know, I just wanted to push in directions, you know, that were um, not conducive to, you know, 2.3 kids in a white picket fence. So, mm. yeah, it was like sayonara. <laughs> Amazing. And look where you are now. Choosing the me over the way. Yep. Exactly. Still single and I'm loving it. (laughs) 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 Yeah, so that is definitely, um, you know, it can bring life-changing events because, you know, Kel, you've had it on an angle I had it Mm. on an angle. And, I mean, even the third and ninth leash, you know, Mm. they're, you know, houses that do support the ascendant. So they certainly, you know, brought those textbook situations. You know, they weren't difficult transits, I guess, for any of us. It was really just, you know, finding, you know, that that part of ourselves that is about ourselves, you know. Um, You, Kel, obviously the foundation of the chart, you leash with um, those supportive houses and me, of course, the first house. So, yeah, I think they're kind of like areas that are activated by eclipses in your chart, you know, every 18 months to two years. They really do bring quite significant internal shifts first and then they can kind Mm. of then um, actualize and it's like you you know your spidey sense is kind of like hmm, maybe I need to put some energy here or there and then it's almost like you you know speak it out or you put plant the seed out there universally and then it all comes to fruition and you know those eclipses kind of like I've often described them in client session. It's like an invisible hand is like pushing at you. Mm. Go here, go there, do that. And mm. it may not necessarily make a logical sense, but it's just this feeling within, this is the direction I have to go. And I can't, and whatever I have to leave behind is sort of what I have to leave behind. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. I say like there's an inner voice beckoning you um, yeah. into a new direction and also saying, you know, because this is, it's oppositions, it's polarities, it's making choices. You know, when you'd say yes to one thing, you have to say no to something else. So exactly. You know, mm. Having had this recent uh, nodal cycle in Capricorn Cancer through my angular houses, I've had, you know, it was a very strong one thing had to go so that something else could be a highlight and a choice. So yeah. Yeah. Mm. totally and it's a phase yeah the only other date i would throw out there is um so the no the last the nodes work as a pair so it it does take about 18 years for the north node to come back to the same sign but about Mm. every eight years we get the reversal where the south node is in like the opposite place so the that that middle point if you like was early march of 2011 to end of August 2012. And at that time we had the North Node in Sag with the South Node in Gemini come forward about eight years to where we are now and we've got the North Node in Gemini with the South Node in Sag. So it's the same part of your chart being activated by the same things but in a slightly different way. So it's a bit of a subtle but important distinction. But I think it's almost like there is that eight-year interval with with some of these mm, cycles. Yeah. Um, even though that is anything happened for you yeah. guys, anything happened for you guys at that time? 
the, oh, 2012 was a massive year. <laughs> what, yeah, it was a pretty big year for me too, uh, particularly with work, yeah. Um, I think that was mm. when I went to the UAC conference in Chicago where I was speaking, you know, at, at quite a large astrological community for the first time. And um, it's when I first met people like um, Chris it, and Austin and that Lisa. New Orleans 2012? I beg your pardon, it was New was Orleans. It? Yeah, not Chicago. Yeah. So, like, that's where yeah. we were just a couple of years ago, Cass. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was New Orleans and it was... It was the last time we had the Venus retrograde in Gemini and the last time we had the nodes in the in the Gemini Sag. So there is that yeah. real Gemini sag type feel. Um, so there is a bit of an echo, if you like, through time from like first half of yeah. 2012 to this middle period of, of 2020. Um, so we have one more thing Full to talk about. Full moon and Scorpio? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So you can't this ignore is the full moon, on... especially in Scorpio. <laughs> no. <laughs> so this is happening <laughs> on Friday the 8th um, at 17 degrees of Scorpio and it's Friday the 8th for everybody. So it's 8.45 p.m. here in Australia. Um, Cass, do you have the numbers for everywhere else or Cal, uh, the timings? Um, uh, yes, I can provide that for you. So uh, the full moon in Scorpio, so May 7 across the board. So Sydney uh, East Coast is 8.45 p.m., uh, New York time zone Eastern is 6.45 a.m. and the London time zone is 11.45 a.m. Okay, so I had it wrong. It is the 7th of May. Um, and, yeah, look, Scorpio, I do love the full moon in Scorpio. For me, it's really a time of Taurus season is so practical, so grounded, so much about the body, so much about the senses that sometimes we forget about our inner life and what's actually going on underneath. And this is where we get called in many ways to go, okay, how do we dig into that space, delve into that space, shine a big spotlight into that space? Um, there is a sense of really heightening you know, the, the moon isn't that comfortable in Scorpio. This is a sign of its fall, technically in traditional astrology. And so it's not as comfortable as it could be, but this is just because of the depth and the intensity of this sign. And I usually say to people when the moon's in Scorpio that the idea is to just dive down take the emotions in a chunk and then bring them back up again like a seabird does. So don't try to stay under the water. A bird can't live under the water just like a fish can't live in the air. So dive down, just have a bit of a look down. Don't stay in the overwhelm and then bring it back up. You know, full moons are always fairly emotional and fairly intense emo um, with that kind of world. So this will add that even more. But if you can bring the inner emotional turmoil up into the practical light of Taurus, get a view on what's happening, digest it, and then fly off. So it's kind of that idea of dip in, dip out, dip in, dip out. So you're not always in the depths of it all um, because, you know, the, the depths of Scorpio can be a place where we can get lost, we can go too far down, we can lose our sense of what's up and what's down. Um, you know, if you've ever been crashed by a big wave in the ocean, sometimes there is that sense of well, which way's up and you have to look around for where the bubbles are rising and follow them. So, yeah, that's my tip for this this full moon is is definitely sit with the emotions, feel the emotions, dwell with them, but don't stay with them too much. Um, and if you need to kind of call a friend or be connected to somebody else who will help pull you out of the potential morass, um, definitely do that. So, yeah. What about you girls? What are you thinking about this? Cass? You can go first, Kel. Okay. Um, I This isn't my favourite full moon. I'll say that at the start. And the reason I, I find it's very deep and this might be our personality. Not that I don't like deep things. I shouldn't make myself sound like a superficial butterfly because I do love a good deep and meaningful. But I think the, the full moon in Scorpio, it does shine a light on emotional depth, on things that are normally hidden or kept out of sight or things that are going on inside you that you might not usually 
usually look at or attend to. So there is a real sense of like having stuff come up from underneath. And I think it's, you know, as you said, Leish, every full moon has a very um, emotional kind of um, quality. It, it stimulates feelings. And to have that full moon in such a profound water sign like Scorpio, I think a lot of the feelings that come up will be maybe some of the uncomfortable feelings, like where you're frustrated about something or where you might be a bit angry about something or where you might be annoyed about something. And when those feelings come up, it's because they need to be attended to or expressed or even actioned. I always think about the full moon in Scorpio being ruled by Mars. So it's like if you're feeling something, we need to have an action leading towards that. And the moon does sort of square Mars shortly after the full moon. So there is a, a feeling of like, maybe tension or frustration or needing to make a decision that's difficult or uncomfortable and maybe events or circumstances near the full moon just really help highlight why you need to do something or the fact that you need to do something sooner rather than later. So it feels like dealing with necessary but maybe slightly uncomfortable um, emotional material, if that makes sense. What about you, Cass? What about you, Cass? <laughs> Yeah. What about me? Um, okay. So yeah, I do agree with you in the sense of, you know, that Mars square, you know, in the mix, um, a couple of days later and, you know, um, the Mars, sorry, not the Mars, the Scorpio full moon is just so, you know, investigative and probing and, and deep and, you know, all of the things that we've already mentioned. And then we've got a square to its ruler in Aquarius that's wants to be more in its head and, you know, more kind of looking at what's up and outwards. And so, you know, when it comes to the emotional full moon in Scorpio, you know, there might be this tension maybe between what the heart wants versus what the head wants and having to make choices around that. And then going into that deep space will will be uncomfortable. But until you go there, then you won't know really which choice you want to make. And I do find that sometimes just the full moon in of itself can often be about choices or having to make a decision or, you know, things are in the balance. Do I go this way or do I go that way? And it will definitely, you know, spotlight um, you know, the Scorpio house, of course, and then that, you know, what am I going to d do and decide and how does that feel and all of those questions. And then in the fixed nature of it all, it's like nothing's going to happen very quickly either. So that might also add to sort of that prolonged potential tension or stress there. So, you know, I think it could, you know, it could be very re revelatory, but with stress attached to that. Mm. Mm. That's beautifully said, actually, Cass, like very revealing, but with a sense of uh, maybe stress or tension. Mm. Joy. It's almost like it has to be done, though. Like it's the, just the so much. The fact that it can, has to be done doesn't change <laughs> the fact that it can be uncomfortable to do, if that makes sense. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's in the discomfort that the – you know, what's the Winston Churchill quote? You know, if you find yourself when you in find health, yourself walking through your own hell, hell just keep, keep walking, walking, kind of thing. Yeah, mm. and this is it. It's like you have to go through it. There's no other way out. We need to face our fears right now. We need to be able to face what's going on. So if we just kind of plaster over the top of the deep uncomfortability and the fears everybody's facing right now, um, it will just sit there and irritate. You know, Scorpio can be a volcano because it can push and push and push things down until they explode out so yeah I don't know there's this sense of the necessary need for this and yeah it'll be stressful I'm not going to say that it's great and I think the reason a caveat on why it's one of my favorite ones is because these days people don't tend to go into their emotional space they do tend to plaster over the top of it so that's why um, I call it my mm. favorite because it calls people into that space um, that yeah. perhaps I inhabit more than others <laughs> totally. yeah I think it definitely um you know it's like you can get deep into that emotion the whole scupio thing and then you know Mars and Aquarius okay let's just think about this for a bit and so it's just that feeling thinking heart and head which are always the most toughest decisions to have to make I think mm. in any situation you know might be the practical or the logical solution, but the heartstrings are pulled or the feelings are hurt, um, you know, that sort of thing. And, you know, that could probably be heightened um, there with this lunation. Yeah. 
Totally. It's a big one, big yeah. one to kind of wind out this two-week period, isn't it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And did we say it was on a Friday so, or not a Thursday? Um, the 7th. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what's coming up this fortnight for you gals? What have you got going on? I'm um, just checking my little calendar here. Um, well, we were going to go away <laughs> for a weekend at the start of May, but we will not be doing that in this new reality. Uh, I'll still be teaching my planets course. So if people miss the first class for that or the first two classes, you can still sign up and catch up. Uh, but I am doing a talk for Nightlight Astrology on Saturday, April, May. So that's May 2nd. Sorry, Saturday, May 2nd, April, May. I don't, I'm clearly still struggling to figure out what month it is. Saturday, May 2nd, it'll be 9 a.m. Pacific time. Um, and that's through Nightlight Astrology. So you can get all the details on their website. I don't know the topic yet. We've just picked the date, but there will be a topic that will be announced uh, by the time this is live. Uh, yeah. What about you gals? What do you have coming up? Cass? Uh, later this month, um, again, I'll have to check the date, but I think it could be on the 31st. I'm delivering a uh, lecture for ESA online, their Star Club. So if you're a member of ESA, oh, you yay. can access that. So I'm excited for that. And cool. I've got some teaching on the program uh, as well, but uh, all to be revealed. <laughs> but, yeah, looking forward to doing the ESA on um i'm pretty sure it's at may 31 june 1st here in australia so not towards the end of the month but um yeah so maybe a great way to embrace the north node in gemini um because you know it's there's a whole massive isa back catalog of things that you can uh, explore um there as well I'm not really sure how i've worded the lecture but it will be about the terms and bounds Excellent. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'll have to actually revisit the topic lecture and work out exactly what I'm presenting, but I've got it all in my head. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. It'd be fun. That'll be great. And it's always these things. We get invited to do these things like so far in advance and then you sort of submit your topic and then it's like what am I where am I speaking and what am I saying and that's right and so it's getting back to the calendar and that's right that's what I was doing um so it's always the uh the sort of lecture um occupational hazard totally and you Leishi what do you got happening I am actually going to be holding a webinar that week on the change of the nodes moving in and what that will mean for the eclipse cycle in the 18 months ahead. So that will be on Wednesday the 6th. Um, More details via my website on exactly when and how that's going to be. I'll also be launching that week a My Steering Currents um, course, which is psychological rather than astrology, but it's all about how you can direct yourself towards what you really do want and how you can let go of things so um old patterns old behaviors so i thought with the nodes moving that it would be a great opportunity to do that too Mm. so yeah all of that if you are a newsletter subscriber will be coming out via newsletter or hop on my website um should we say what our newsletters are because i know we always or our websites are sorry because i know we always forget that yeah so yours is mine's kellysastrology.com cass cassandratindall.com and mine's aliciayusuf.com. So, yeah, hop on over. That's cool. us. <laughs> Thanks, Come girls. visit us. Yeah. Good, <laughs> good to dig into the nodes with you both this week and all the other yeah, astrology. Sure. And yeah, yeah. We'll be back in a fortnight. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye.